This Bozo Cabana is a worthless orphan loser who does nothing but slave away in the fields until one day he finds out he's actually an immortal demon. But before this happens, in a village outside Tokyo, some livestock suddenly start turning up dead. So they call in a specialist named Inugami to investigate. Some kids hear about Inugami's arrival from Tokyo, and as they all plan to meet him, Yatoro, the leader of the group, calls out to Kabane. Yatoro personally informs Kabane that he's not invited while he smells like dog shit. Meanwhile, Inugami laments over his flat tire when a woman pulls up and asks if he's the man from Tokyo, and when he confirms this, she reveals that she's his client and tells him to get in the car. On the way, she tells him about the livestock that mysteriously turned up rotten even though they were alive the previous day, and tells him to keep the situation between them so they don't scare the kids. Later at the villa, they sit and talk while the kids stare like they've seen a celebrity. The Inugami takes a look around and notices Kabane working in the fields. He calls out to him, but Kabane only gestures and heads back to work. So Inugami asks what his deal is, but the woman says she'll fill him in soon. Later, Inugami soaks off in a hot spring when Yataro offers to wash his back, and Inugami apparently sees nothing wrong with this and invites Yataro in. Yataro introduces himself as the son of the hostess, and in the hopes that Inugami would invite him to Tokyo, proceeds to kiss enough ass to contract an STD. Unfortunately for Yataro, Inugami is more interested in talking about Kabane. Yataro happily tells him how they leave Kabane to work in the fields all day because his body odor will repel customers but this only makes Inugami more interested. Later, he meets up with the hostess while Yataro eavesdrops excitedly, but is shocked to hear him request for Kabane instead. The next day, the hostess reluctantly tells Kabane what to do, so he gets himself cleaned up and heads for Inugami's room, where he welcomes him inside. After Kabane serves the food, he tries to leave, but Inugami drags him back and explains that he's a detective that specializes in the occult and wants to know if he's seen anything strange in the fields. Kabane understands but offers to respond later so he doesn't ruin his meal, but Inugami doesn't quite understand. So Kabane explains that no one can eat near him because the sheer stench coming from his body will make a person throw it right back up. Inugami asserts that it's just a guy thing and hygiene is of low priority among his co-workers anyway. So Kabane mentions the rotting livestock, which surprises Inugami since the hostess hadn't told anyone. Kabane explains that he's tasked with getting rid of the bodies and it only seems to happen on a new moon. Inugami commends him for being so useful that confirms that the next new moon will be in five days. Later, the hostess finds him shoveling gunk with Kabane and asks what the hell he's doing. So he says he's helping out the kids since he has some free time which shocks her and the kids, especially Yataro, who's jealous he isn't getting the attention instead. After that, Inugami continues to spend all of his time with Kabane and learn from him, while Kabane continues to tend to his needs. One day in the field, Inugami questions about his necklace. According to Kabane, he's had it since he was a kid, but doesn't know much about it since he was abandoned by his parents. Inugami takes a closer look at it and identifies it as a lifestone. He explains that it's the equivalent of leaving a Dior bag with your child, meaning he couldn't have been abandoned. Inugami asks if he'd like to meet his parents since he can track them down as a detective, and Kabane says he might be interested. On the night of the new moon, Kabane waits for Inugami when Yataro shows up and accuses him of stealing his chance of going to Tokyo, calling him a useless, abandoned child, and Kabane retorts that he wasn't abandoned. Yataro, thinking shit was sweet out here, yanks Kabane's necklace from him and immediately learns, when you talk shit, you get hit. Once Yataro gets up to face Kabane again, he sees Kabane has been on that demon timing all alone and he's officially fucked up. And in the process of losing control, Kabane stares at Yataro's ass for a concerning amount of time. More on that later. So Yataro runs for his life. Kabane manages to grab the stone and return to normal. Later, Inugami looks around for Kabane and finds him curled up, claiming to be the monster responsible. So to comfort him, he decides to pull down his pants and show off his tail. What the fuck? After, he explains that there are beings called kimonos that rarely get involved with humans but sometimes have children with them, which is what Kabane is, a half-human, half-bloodless demon. When he sees the look on Kabane's face, he pulls a gun out from thin air and says he's not human either, then assures him the lifestone from his parents prevents him from attacking humans, which means he's not the one who attacked the animals. Kabane then realizes Yataro is still outside and isn't aware of the attack, so they rush to look for the little shithead. Meanwhile, Yataro remembers when they were kids and he accidentally pushed Kabane into the canal, but something that wasn't blood came out of him, so he ran away, but now he knows it wasn't just his imagination. 
He tries to get into the house, but is suddenly attacked by some demon dogs. Before one can use him as a chew toy, Inugami shoots its head off while Kabane holds the other one off. Sinigami warns him that ghouls don't die, but they stop moving if you cut off their heads. With this new information, Kabane instantly twists its head and chops it off. Inugami is surprised by his lack of hesitation, then he turns his attention to the gaping hole in one of the ghouls. Suddenly, a bigger ghoul emerges, but it moves much faster than Inugami can react to. Inugami barely manages to dodge his attack and lands a shot on its head. However, it grows it back immediately. Before Inugami can light it up some more, Kabane springs into action. For a kid that's never killed before, he pulls off an impressive fatality by shoving his hand down his throat and ripping its head clean off. Inugami just sits there thinking about how badly he needs this kid on his squad. As they head back, Kabane wonders what to do next since Yatara knows what he is now. This is when Inugami suddenly reveals the truth. <laughs> お前の正体を知っていたんだよ。狼の姉。お前の母さんからお前を預かったと聞いたらしい。秘密裏にお前を殺すことに決めたそうだ。真犯人は別にいたわけだけど、やたろうがこれじゃな。言っても信じないだろ
Inugami explains that the bugs are usually harmless, but become persistent when they find an item they really like. In order to free the mother and her child, they'll have to find and remove the item at the center of the swarm. Inugami wants to go in, but it will require him turning himself into steel, which will take a considerable amount of time. Time that they don't have. One of the men tells Inugami that a member of the rescue team already went inside, and after witnessing what those bugs do to people, he's convinced that they'll need therapy, and that the mother is already dead. Come on, man. He chokes on it, but he suggests that they just burn the whole place down to protect everyone else, which is a crazy thing to say right in front of her kids. Inugami even tells him to watch what he's saying, because he really doesn't know what he's talking about. But policeman insists that they're already dead. So now the son interjects and tells him to put some respect on his mama name because she wouldn't go out like that. You just suck at your job. Now save her before it's too late. Inugami really wishes he could cover himself and steal faster. But then Shiki offers to use his webs to contain the bugs while removing whatever is attracting them. This is the first time we see to Spider-Man's ability in action. Shiki fires his spunk into the room and manages to capture a majority of the bugs. Kabane praises him right before the bugs just chew through the web. Inugami resolves himself to go in, even if he isn't fully still yet. But Kabani interrupts and suggests just brute forcing it. Obviously, the other kids think he'll die right away and protest the idea. Kabani ignores them and Inugama, happy that little homie volunteered for him, greenlights the plan. Now Shiki and Akira think Inugami has gone crazy and call him an op as he lets Kanabe in. Inugami tells them, nah, I'm not selling, y'all just ain't familiar with this game. When inside, the creepy crawlies cover up his entire body as the team watches. Then Inugami finally explains that Kabane actually doesn't have blood at all, so the bugs can't inject them with their paralytic. On top of that, immortal demons don't feel pain. He doesn't flinch, he doesn't waver, he don't even care. It isn't long before Kabane reaches the center of the swarm and discovers the item that attracted the bugs in the first place. Inugami instructs him to raise the item up and when he does, the bugs suddenly vanish freeing the mom and her son. After Inugami reports to the rescue team that none of their lives are in danger anymore, the kids immediately rush in and reunite with their family, even though they're still unconscious. The rescue team starts to attend to them and Kabane stares at them, thinking about his own family and could almost swear he could feel them, which makes Inugami feel bad for him. Later, the team stand outside and Akira wonders why the bugs were after a pair of shoes. So Inugami explains that those types of bugs feed on guilt which means the shoes are most likely stolen. The older brother comes up to thank them and asks what might have caused the incident, and Inugami tells him that they should stay out of trouble and return the shoes to where they came from. As Kabani hands him the shoes, the boy explains that since they're from a single mom family, she takes care of herself last, and her shoes are always worn out. So his kid brother suggested they give her these shoes. Even though they knew they were stolen, his brother didn't seem to see the problem. When he yelled at his brother about it, he felt really guilty and suddenly got surrounded by the demon bugs while he stepped back in fear. Her mother quickly rushed in to help him but got swallowed up too. Afterwards, the team heads back to the car to leave, when Kabane calls for Inugami's attention and asks if he'll get to meet his parents if he works for him. Inugami realizes that Kabane had been lying back in the village and was only trying to protect him, so he asks him again if he'd like to meet his parents and Kabane says he does. Inugami says he'll take his fees out of his pay and Akira welcomes him to the team. Later, Shiki opens up and says that his mom was a spider kimono, which is why he could produce silk. So Kabane asks if she's still alive, and when Shiki says he has no idea, Kabane insists that she's alive. Shiki tells him there's no proof of that and either they were abandoned or their parents are dead, telling him to give up on false hope. But Kabane refuses to believe that. Up until now, he'd lived in darkness, but Inugami became a light for him, a light that he will never extinguish. Shiki is flustered by the sudden glazing and says he's headed off to bed. Kabane bids him goodnight and Shiki tells him he'll show him where his bed is, signifying the two finally getting along. Inugami smiles as he eavesdrops and later speaks to an unidentified woman on the phone. Inugami reports the completion of their last job, revealing the mysterious woman to be a client of some sort is interested in Kabane because of his lifestone. At Inugami's bar, Inugami tells the group of kids they must meet someone named Anari. Of course, our diva Shiki doesn't like her, prompting Kabane to ask who she is. Inugami explains that she's also a kimonoist and works with the police, making her pretty useful. 
Nobody asks, but Shiki makes sure to tell Kabane that he doesn't intend for them to be buddies. Akira, on the other hand, is excited and wants to go sightseeing after visiting the police station. Before leaving, Inugami pulls Kabane to the side and hands him something to take along. Meanwhile, Inari walks toward the police station with Kone and is greeted by her Yes Man cops. The Tier 3 subs profess how they'll do anything to please her, so as a reward, the red-haired seductress releases her pheromones into the air like an OnlyFans model sharing a discount code. The pheromones she released leave the men entranced. Later, after the kids enter the police station, Shiki gets into a quarrel with the receptionist who is taking it upon himself to gatekeep his queen. According to him, the kids just aren't cool enough to warrant Inari's attention. Thankfully, Khan comes out to ask which of the three is Kabane. When Kabane answers, she tells him to come with her. Shiki doesn't miss a beat on gloating to the cop but gets shut down once Kana asserts she only needs Kabane. Not much is said between Kana and Kabane, then once they reach Inari's office, she kicks him into the room. Inari offers him a seat, and he sits down while Khan stands behind him. Inari explains that she's aware of his origin story, and asks to see the plot device. While examining it, she explains how kimonos feed off the life energy of humans, and how she and Inugami are two sides of the same coin. Inari suspiciously finishes off her monologue by telling Kabane that his lifestone will prevent their need for humans. Alright, before Kabane can even process that ominous sentence, Khan beheads him like King Louis XVI. Inari packs up to leave but remembers that there are two others and tells Khan to take them out before calling her obsequious little servant a good girl. Meanwhile, Shiki is angry that he has to wait for so long while Akira continues his influence or lifestyle. Kabane mysteriously returns to them with a briefcase and tells them that he must deliver it to Inari-sama. Shiki and Akira feel like something is amiss, but Khan sells the whole operation once Shiki insults Inari. Man, she had one job, but now that her cover is blown, she switches to a full frontal attack. Shiki attempts to reason with the little pyromaniac, reminding her that there are humans in the area. And that's when Kon reveals that the entire police station is under Inari Tsukiyomi. Shiki, realizing she ain't stopping, uses his webs to create a barrier of wooden furniture. Khan must do this often because they're all enchanted with fire resistance. With technique that Tobey Maguire will be proud of, nabs the briefcase from Kon's hands. Man, she really sucks at her job. Shiki opens the case to find Kabane's head just vibing inside. What's up? While Akira passes out, Kong goes absolute ape shit. Or fox shit, I guess. Kabane instructs Shiki to throw him at the fox girl, and after a bit of banter, Shiki caves in. With a throw that looked a little my homie, Kabane manages to land a bite so powerful that Khan goes down, and with her, the fire. Apparently, it was all an illusion, meaning she wasn't a fire type, but psychic. Huh. No wonder Crunch was super effective. Kabane regenerates his body and the two end up the fight with a failed fist bump. Later, Inugami reveals that he actually just pulled a Shikumaru and everything went exactly as he predicted. The last stone Inari took turned out to be a MacGuffin and Inugami makes sure to assert his dominance over her, claiming if she tries that bullshit again, he personally deal with her. Inugami takes out her anger on a taxi driver, leading the car to crash, and as bystanders wonder what happened, she walks away happily. As the boys drive home, they decide on having pancakes and Chinese for dinner, of which they pay the price for shortly after. Suddenly, Khan reveals herself and uses the last of her energy to yell how she won't fail her mission, then fails her mission. Of course, the gang take care of the poor girl by feeding her some pizza. Khan attempts to attack Kabane once again, but Inugami pacifies her by exploiting her obsession with Inari. The episode ends with a customer entering the bar. He was drawn in by the light outside the building. Inigami notes that they've got a new job. The man who entered the bar is wasted all over the counter, ranting about how his e-girl won't reveal any of her personal information. It's obvious that it's the first time he's received attention from a female because he claims her being nice is a sign of affection. Kabane becomes interested in the topic of love and inquires Inugami about it. Inugami doesn't even know where to start, so instead of parenting, he sends them on the love mission. In addition, he sends Kon with them and offers Kabane's head as a reward. W manipulation. The man identifies himself as Yaruno before turning into a cat and pouncing on a rat, which shocks everyone. He apologizes and explains that he's been collecting rats to give to his lover, then reveals a pouch full of dead ones. The sight alone causes Akira to run to the restroom. Inugami notes that Yaruno must have a cat possession caused by a kimono that turns into an attractive man or woman to lure prey. Later, Inugami decides that Akira should stand by on this mission, causing Akira to question if he's holding everyone back. Of course, a flamethrower in the ocean will be more useful than Akira when he's grossed out, but Inugami assures him that he'll be more reliable on missions without grotesque sights. On the mission, it's revealed that Yoruno is in love with a stripper, 
So the dude is down bad for a girl that is paid to be nice to him? After showing the kids a picture of Mao Chan, his interest, Kabane and Khan attempt to enter, but Shiki stops them. Dumb and Dumber won't be allowed in since they're kids. Then Yorono casually mentions how he stalks the brothel, waiting for Mao to come out but never catches her. Just then, the gang notice her in the form of a cat. The gang catch up to Mao in an alley and explain they were sent by Inugami. Mao transforms into her human form and reveals what happened to the clients before Yoruno. Mao questions why Yoruno hadn't been transformed. When Kabane tells her that she doesn't make him horny, she makes him happy. Mao busts out laughing at him. Just then, Khan manages to grab Mao and brings her over to Yoruno. Yoruno shares his bag of dead mice and gives the basic background story of every simp. How he's a disappointment to his parents who would rather just live as her slave. Even though it's pathetic, points to him for doubling down anyway. Once the mission is over, Inugami gives Khan a decoy Kabane head to satisfy her. Then Kabane just drops the hardest philosophy tech talk about love that has ever come from a 13 year old's mouth. He offers to give everyone gifts as thanks for being his lights. The next day, Inugami mentions that Yoruno and Mao stopped by and Holy shit, this guy actually bagged her, what the fuck? Yeah, even Shiki knows this isn't real life. Anyway, Akira is insecure about his usefulness to the team even more now. So as a solution, he becomes Kabane's apprentice. The two agree to go on a mission and investigate the numerous deaths around the Shibuya River. Shiki warns Akira of how nasty it'll be, but he resolves to prove his worth. At the location, Akira arrives in a hazmat suit fit to collect scrap for the company. To pump himself up, he rushes into the sewer, only to slip immediately after. Inside, Akira gets jump scared by a leech that falls from the ceiling. Of course, Kabane takes care of it and numerous other leeches. Akira marvels at Kabane's treatment of animals, and Kabane just explains that there's no need to kill them unless he has to. Akira says that Kabane actually reminds him of his brother. Turns out Akira is one part of a set of twins from a village high in the mountains. They're called Yuki Onoko, and there, males are born once every 100 years, so everyone else is female. <laughs> he explains a lot. He came to Tokyo after fleeing the village and getting separated from his brother, but hopes to find him again. Here, we learn that Akira actually has ice powers, but their discussion is cut short by a giant man frog who face masks Akira. The frog is taken out by a tanuki sent by Inugami, and explains that there are even more frogs. The new objective is to lure them out with a blood vial and take them out. The battle begins, and Kabane and the tanuki begin working together to take out each frog. Kabane gives them that Tyson special, and Akira's estrogen takes over again. Akira mentally struggles with memories of his brother telling him he's weak and to avoid fighting. However, after seeing Kabane get hurt defending him, Akira overcomes his big brother's influence and turns the sewer into an ice sculpture, including Kabane. The mission ends with Inugami receiving appreciation from the great Sage Toad. Some days later, Kabane does some chores when he stumbles on something strange and remembers Inugami's warning to never open the door at the end of the hallway. However, as he stands there, a hand suddenly reaches out and drags him inside. Shiki and Akira report him missing, and when they tell Inugami where they last saw him, he suddenly rushes through the hallway to the mystery room. Inside, he finds Kabane obeying the whim of a strange man who Inigami calls Mihai. Inigami tells him to stop treating him as a slave, but Mihai denies this allegation while introducing himself as the vampire who provides IT services for the business. Mihai then declares that Kabane is to be his designated weight person, granting him jurisdiction of opening and closing his bottles. Kabane accepts it with zero hesitation since he's lived his whole life a slave already. Inigami meets with the kids outside and tells them that vampires have superhuman strength and are almost immortal. But because Mihai hates being idle, he learned pretty much everything about everything. After hearing of his skills, Inugami invited him to the office where he got obsessed with online games. He warns him there's no telling what he might do when he's in a bad mood though. So Shiki asks why he even brought the nutcase on board. Inugami confesses that tech makes him feel like a boomer, so Mihai is the one that takes care of all the tech parts of the business. He warns the kids to stay away from him, but it flies right out of their ears as Shiki soon confronts Mihai for taking advantage of Kabane. Mihai gets tired of the constant nagging and offers them a deal, that if they can beat him in arm wrestling, he'll let Kabane go, even saying they can try as many times as they want. So Shiki tries and tries, but just gets swatted to the side like a bug or a spider, all the while Akira sits on the sideline, not wanting what Shiki's having. Kabane offers to try out too, and though it's a bit more difficult for Mihai, he eventually floors them. Later, the kids report their disgraceful loss to Inugami, who totally saw it coming since he's a vampire. Then they inform him that Kabane has gone to shop for dinner. On the way, Kabane wonders why he couldn't beat him and if it would be possible if he had the power from back then. 
So after washing up, he sits on a park bench and wonders how he can get stronger so he can protect the others. Just then, Khan falls out of a tree and is surprised to see Kabane, who makes a pathetic attempt to hide his face, but Khan tells him she's not that stupid. But it doesn't even matter anymore anyway. She sits with him and tells him how the day she returned with his fake head, there was already another Kitsune with Inari and she didn't even look at her once. Kabane doesn't really care about a sob story and instead asks her to fight him. So the homeless reject agrees to it and they start to go at it. After exchanging several blows, Khan gets to jump on him and starts beating him senseless like it'll solve her problems. Kabane manages to push her off, making her cry as she realizes that her weakness is probably what got her tossed out like last week's leftovers. When she starts to ugly cry, Kabane tries to comfort her and grabs her hand. Meanwhile, Inugami is shocked to see the pale one actually left his room, so Mihai tells him he can't play his game because Kabane broke his wrist and it'll take him a week to recover. Since he's bored, he offers to help with work and heads to the computer to accept a job posting. But Inugami rushes over and when he sees what he picked, he tells him he will be the one responsible for it. Mihai then says he'll rather have the boys do it while he watches as entertainment, and when Nagami says someone could die, he claims he has a plan and invites him back to his room. Back at the park, Khan rests on Kabane like a park bench, but when he wonders what he should do about her, he wakes her up and asks if she wouldn't mind living with Nagami too, but she refuses since she's a Kitsune. However, she says she could live with him in the park instead, but he says he's gotta get dinner and take it home, and promises to come back right after. So she agrees and waits eagerly for him. Later. He arrives home to find Mihai and the boys, who tell him they have an important mission to do. Then Mihai tells them Inugami has something important to attend to. Shiki gets excited about the mission and says that there's something he's been dying to try out. He begins by chugging a large bottle of water with multiple heaters surrounding him, causing him to sweat profusely, and like a deadbeat father, vanishes. Mihai had guessed that since Shiki is the son of an arachne, he might be capable of camouflage. Turned out to be true. After that, the three boys head out to a facility as Mihai guides them from his laptop and tells them that this mission is to investigate why a facility that was known for a high rate of suicide suddenly dropped down to none at all. Akira is excited that Inugami would trust him with something so big, but in reality, he's banging on the inside of Mihai's room struggling to get out because his only means of escape is his arch nemesis, technology. Back at the facility, Shiki uses his silk to open up a window and sneak inside. When he asks what the deal is with the toy car, Mihai says it's a tricked out car he designed to assist him on the mission. Shiki heads deeper into the facility till he notices a room filled with workers that all look like they're desperately holding in a fart. Shiki reports this to the rest of the team, then suddenly one of the men runs out screaming that he quits, and a lady who seemed to be the manager appears and manages to calm him down, then guides him to a room to get him something to drink. Shiki follows after them quietly, and after going through the restricted area, they go into a dark room but when the lights turn on, a giant mosquito head sticks his needle into his ear and sucks out whatever was left of his brain. The creature transforms back into a woman, happy about the snack, but when the other woman complains of getting nothing, the manager tells them she'll get her turn the next day. Before long, the man stands up again and returns to work and the group wonders what the hell is going on here. So Mihai goes to Inugami to confirm what they're dealing with, then tells the kids that brain sucking mosquitoes leave the victims alive so they can continue their work mindlessly, which explains the low mortality right now. Kabane suggests that they take them out, but Shiki says that they should retreat and wait to discuss with Inugami for a plan. Mihai can't believe how boring the kids are, and just for his twisted entertainment, he decides to take matters into his own hands and ram the car into the wall multiple times for the woman to hear and get suspicious. One of them walks out and sees the car, but she hides it in her jacket and lies to the others about finding nothing. They decide to split up and see if anything fishy is going on. As they snoop around, Shiki uses his camouflage to hide in plain sight. He manages to remain undetected until the coast is clear. Just when he thinks it's safe, one of the mosquito heads returns and spots him. She begins to sneak up on him when she suddenly gets a taste of the Fly Swatter 3000. The toy car comes flying out as Mihai asks what the hell is Shiki doing? But Shiki doesn't even respond. Now of all times, Shiki is having a panic attack. Shiki remembers how he grew up with his mother but draws a blank on how they got separated signifying some level of trauma is at play here. Meanwhile, Kabane and Akira rush to find Shiki as Mihai cooks up some crap about his hand slipping, causing him to accidentally alert the Kamenos. As the two search for an entrance, they suddenly run into one of the brain suckers. Back upstairs, Shiki's body still refuses to move and he struggles to talk no jitsu himself. Mihai explains the horrors he'll experience if he doesn't do something before she gets up. This only intensifies Shiki's paralysis and he wishes anyone would come to save him. That is until he hears Kabane's voice through the phone. As he's dragging the mosquito woman along, he tells them they already beat one of them up, 
and he's sure Shiki will be fine too since he's strong. Mihai piggybacks off this compliment to remind Shiki that he can't let Kabane see him getting bitched. This was just enough to make Shiki snap and pull himself together. Similarly, Bug Eyes is fully recovered and launches at him to kick off the second round. Shiki avoids and uses his camouflage to hide away. This ain't a problem for Mosquito Girl though, as her heightened senses allow her to pick up any signs of life to locate him. But Shiki was playing chess while Homegirl was still learning Connect 4. Not sure when he found the time to do it, but he's covered the room in sweat and odor to make himself completely undetectable. Out of desperation, Flight Lady attacks carelessly, not realizing she was a fly caught in the web. Checkmate, bitch. Shiki gives her the old Spongebob cleats treatment and it's a job well done. In the post-fight, Shiki reflects on how he may be ready to learn about his parents and his troubling past. The three reunite and tie up both Mosquito Girls and lead them to Bicker. Kabane suggests that they go after the final Kimeno now that they have the numbers advantage. But this will no longer be necessary because our final boss reveals herself. She attempts to negotiate her sister's release, but Kabane ain't having it. As a response, the elder sister pulls a one-punch man in order to become the queen of the itch. The three quickly find out they're all classed. Akira actually tries hoping for once, but his power is useless without water. Seeing his friends get murked, Kabane starts going apeshit, because as we've seen before, that always works. Mihai chimes in to give Kabane some advice, and Mosquito Queen just lets it happen, I guess? Mihai teaches Kabane to draw out his kimono strength by following his heart's desire, and he rips her arms off like a Barbie girl. Homegirl begs for mercy and the only reason Kabane doesn't kill her is because Inugami stops him. Look little man, we're not getting paid extra to kill. Just then, Anari's new assistant, Nobimaru, arrives to take care of the corpses himself. While burning their bodies, he tests Kabane's gangster by asking if he feels bad about it. Kabane makes it known that he's from the streets and don't feel a thing for these bitches. This pleases Nobimaru enough to warn Kabane that Inari is still fiending for his chain. But as it turns out, he's actually not fucking with Inari either. It's uncertain of whether Nobimaru is staging a coup d'etat or is just trying to earn Kabane's trust, but the information is helpful. Back at the house, the kids confront Mihai for lying about everything and putting them in danger. But he insists that they couldn't possibly grow under Inugami's easy missions. Although it's partially true, Inugami tells him not to fall for the bastard's manipulation and congratulates the game for a job well done. As Mihai heads to his room, he reaffirms Inugami that he wouldn't mind helping the boys progress more, but he can't help if he gets a little devious. The next morning, Kabane is attached to Shiki like a lost puppy. The gang can tell Kabane has really started to care about them, all while perpetually looking like an angry pit bull. Kabane does a head count and realizes he'd completely forgotten about Khan. He races back to the park and calls for her, who immediately falls out of a tree. She's excited to see him, but that excitement swiftly becomes lethargy when Kabane confesses that he'd forgotten her. To add insult to injury, some fish that Khan caught the share fall beside her, and she explains how they'd gone rotten while she waited for him. While Khan questions the importance of her existence, Shiki confronts Inugami about his parents. The episode opens with the group heading towards the mountains where Shiki was raised. Kabane congratulates Shiki on getting to meet his parents, and Shiki plays it cool. Turns out, they're planning to meet Shiki's uncle, the one who raised him, to discover what happened to his mom. Once they arrive in town, Inugami leads the children to their own devices. This leads to them finding a book containing an old folktale about a spider that could weave golden webs. While marveling at the tale, Shiki notices a purple-haired girl, even younger than them, gazing at him, then suddenly runs off. Shortly after, Inugami arrives with Shiki's uncle, who he greets fondly. The group are headed into the forest when Shiki hears a distant voice call his name. Once they're at the river, Akio explains how he's the younger brother of Shiki's father and that he's a scholar. Years ago, when both Shiki's father and Akio were researching the legend of the Nishikigumo, the story about the golden webs, they stumbled upon an arachne kimono, Kumi. Akio admits that he kept some parts of Shiki's past hidden from him, and the two spend some time alone to discuss it. Shiki is told that Shiki's father died while Kumi was pregnant with him, then soon after giving birth, died of an illness as well. They chop up Shiki's memory loss from seeing his dead mother. Shiki claims it's a relief to finally know, and even tells Kabane that he hopes he finds his parents. But Kabane fails to read the room, and points out that Shiki seems to be trying too hard to hold back his feelings. Akira tries to tell him to shut up so they can pretend that he's not fighting back tears. Inugami then asks where Akio is and Shiki says he's still by the riverbed. Later, while the boys are in a bathhouse, Nobimaru drops in on them despite the fact he was never invited. He reveals that he's a kitsune but assures him that he's not really a threat, which Kabane ain't buying for a second. Nobimaru then suggests they all go watch fireflies to cheer up Shiki. 
Akira and Shiki have fun watching and Kabane thanks Nobumaro for his suggestion. Unfortunately, the only thing Nobumaro cares about is stirring jealousy in the group by suggesting that Kabane should be glad that Shiki's parents are dead. After all, it would be difficult to be happy for Shiki if Kabane's parents aren't alive as well, right? Well, that tactic falls flat because he chose the one kid on the planet immune to instigation. All Nobumaro can do is lament about how hard it is to manipulate someone with the emotional range of a teaspoon. But the night takes an even deeper left turn when Shiki finds the most distraught looking tree in the forest. But it unlocks a suppressed memory for him. A memory that leads him to a path that he took as a child to find where his mother was working. Struggling to unveil suppressed memories, Shiki realizes that Akio's been telling him 1 plus 1 equals 4 his whole life, and now nothing's adding up. Shiki has flashbacks of his mother in chains and dirty syringes before it all goes blank until he finds the house again. After examining the shed, Nobimaru reveals a bit of history around the black market and a blacklisted man who shares the name of Shiki's uncle. Shiki begins connecting the dots, and even without the truth fully unveiled, he knows he may just wind up spinning the block on his own uncle. Kabane, like a true homie, is ready to ride with Shiki regardless of his decision. And just like Shiki, Inugami also wants to get to the bottom of it all and confronts Akio about the golden silk. Akio willingly admits that he discovered and had been trying to sell the golden silk, and in his own fucked up logic, believed he was doing right by humanity. Akio confesses to everything. He explains how after the death of Shiki's father, he persuaded Kumi to volunteer in an experiment that would make them rich. The goal was to produce a kimono that could produce the golden web, using Kumi as a maternal base. And day in, day out, Akio performed these cruel experiments on Kumi until she was broken mentally. The real reason Shiki had memory loss is because he discovered what they were doing, and Akio managed to bash him in the head with a rock before Shiki could do anything. Afterwards, Akio distanced Shiki from his mom and continued to run the test till they finally created it, the Golden Silk. Then, Akio finally reveals what it was all really about by proclaiming how he'd become the most remarkable man in all of history. When Akio finishes descending into madness, Inugami reveals that Shiki had been listening in the entire time. Oh yeah, it's up. Akio begins begging for his pathetic life hoping to convince Shiki that he only tried to help them. But it falls on deaf ears. No one, including an Ugami, feels like sparing him. Nobimaru even suggests bashing the back of his neck. At that moment, Akira comes in, throwing off the whole vibe with a full-on meltdown about being left behind. Inugami tries to comfort him when a giant kimono ambushes from the bush, but Inugami keeps his blicky specifically for cases like this. Unfortunately, he's been poisoned by the attack and can't use it anymore leaving him and Akira vulnerable enough to get snatched. More spider hybrid kimonos emerge to help Akio. Akio reveals that they're all Shiki's siblings. Each one is a product of Kumi's suffering. And to make matters even worse, they're able to mimic the words that Kumi repeated the most. And in his mother's voice, Shiki hears, over and over again. Can't even blame this literal child for breaking down from this. What ensues next is the literal definition of Black Air Force energy. Kabane is ready to run the fade with any and everybody once Shiki gives the say so. Meanwhile, Inugami and Akira get cornered by more birth defects until the young purple haired girl from before stops them. Without revealing her identity, she offers to help Inugami heal his arm and cut back to young Tyson Fury who's boxing in every weight class except his own. I mean, how did Kumi even give birth to that thing? The little vandal even goes as far to say that his only target is actually Akio. He ain't even trying to kill the other abominations, they're just in the way. Oh, but he gonna get his. Cut back to the other three as they arrive at the spring. The girl tells Inugami to dip his hand inside to cure the poison, and though he doesn't believe it, the spring instantly cures his arm which shocks them. She then tells him the spring seems to have a detoxification effect, as many other kimonos come here to heal as well. Inugami, again, asks who she is, but she refuses to identify herself until she asks Akio a question. At the same time, all the teenage mutant kimono siblings lay dead on the floor as Kabane walks towards Akio, who should be shitting himself right about now. With no more ops remaining, Kabane manhandles Akio and tosses him down at Shiki's feet. Kabane is ready to end Akio's subscription to life early when Shiki tells him that hearing his mother's voice made him realize that revenge just won't bring her back. Before deciding what to do with the worm, the young girl, along with Inugami and Akira, arrive to the scene. 
It becomes apparent that Akio knows who the girl is because he calls her Aya and completely loses his composure. Aya wants to know where Akio hid a cocoon that she made before they kill him. Akio realizes he has a bargaining chip now and proclaims how it makes him untouchable. Which doesn't really make any sense because Shiki already said he wasn't going to kill him, but have your little power trip I guess. Then it's cut short immediately by Inugami calling Mihai. Turned out that him being dead or alive didn't make a difference because Inugami and Mihai pinpoint the cocoon that Akio was hiding in literally 10 seconds. With this, the girl sprints out of there while Akio screams at her to stop. Yungo realizes the reason why the spring has healing abilities is because part of her cocoon was dissolved in it. Once she arrives at the spring, Shiki offers to dive in and find the cocoon. There, at the very bottom, Shiki finds his mother and rescues her. Here it is revealed that Aya is indeed the golden weapon that Akio sought after and that their mother is still alive. The group reunite with Shiki and his mother and discuss how Akio's entire legacy will be eviscerated by Inari. And Akio just continues to spiral downward about how he was an inch away from mass production when Shiki gets fed up with him still talking. The gang agreed to leave Akio as the little disheveled mess he is because at this point, killing him would be merciful. Shiki turns to Aya and tells her she's coming too and before she can object, he drags her along with him. At the car, Kabane notices that Nobimaru seems to have disappeared. Turns out, Nobimaru was never going to let Akio live after all. In fact, he planned on killing him from the very beginning for crossing Inari. In a flash, Nobimaru swiftly sends Akio to whatever part of hell won't reject him. On the flip side of things, the gang takes Shiki's mother to a kimono clinic and the episode ends with the introduction of a vet named Ohana. Our Dr. Ohana inspects Shiki's mother and says the problem has to be psychological, so she promises to get an effective treatment for her. Inagami explains that Ohana is a human who started treating kimono in the course of her veterinary career. Ohana allows the group to use some patient beds for the night, and Akira becomes especially excited to take a bath. As the others leave the room, Aya looks back and sees Shiki planted by their mother's side. Later that night, Aya stands outside the room, unable to bring herself to go in as she remembers the past. Her first task was to heal her badly injured mother, but she hadn't mastered her ability until she was three. She was given clothes and toys as needed, but was still seen as merchandise. Akio would mistreat her when she disobeyed. Luckily, she was too valuable to risk hurting, so Aya managed to get by. She spent most of her time in a basement room with her sleeping mother and just stayed by her side when she felt lonely. One day, she discovered she had an older brother and since then, she dreamed that he would one day come to her rescue like a Prince Charming in the books she read. And when her mother got better, they'd all be one happy family. But it was just a pipe dream. Just when she's about to leave, Shiki calls out to her and invites her in. Aya presses him about why she was allowed to live while the rest of their siblings were murked. After all, she's as much a product of the experiments as the others. Shiki closes his fear by telling Aya that she's the only reason his mother is even alive right now. Aya is moved by Shiki's words and as if hearing her children getting along was the cure, Sleeping Beauty finally arises from her slumber. The whole family's reunited, and everyone else wakes up to witness Shiki and Aya's dream finally come true. A week later, the gang lament over Shiki missing from the dinner table. Now that his mom is back, he's decided to make sure she makes a full recovery. But could also spell Shiki quitting the team for good. In Speak of the Devil, Shiki arrives to tell them he won't be quitting for a while, especially now that he owes Kabane a favor. Aya enters the room, almost completely unrecognizable. Now that she's no longer being sheltered, she's ready to enter her suppressed diva phase. While ignoring her older brother, Aya signs a contract to work at Ohana's clinic, and while continuing to ignore her brother, starts dating Kabane. And to add even more shit to the fan, Kone enters the fray. Seeing Aya clinging to Kabane fills her with emotions she's not quite familiar with yet, and the prepubescent love triangle begins. The rest of this episode can be chopped up to Khan making a fool of herself to impress Kabane. When it falls flat, Khan takes out her anger on Aya, but Kabane stops her. Her jealousy only intensifies, and the gash in her heart only grows deeper, and now she's probably having PTSD from when Inari replaced her. So she runs away before causing more trouble. Kabane and Aya solve the Faro Kimono case and return home. Kabane ain't exactly clueless about emotions anymore. So he stops by the park to comfort the heartbroken Khan. Neither of them understand their feelings at all. But Khan knows she feels better when Kabane puts his hand on her cheek. Khan asks what she has to do to become the most important person in his life. And Kabane gives her the, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that. Meanwhile, 
Kumi finishes praying for all the children she lost and thanks Inugami for coming with her, who cheers her up by encouraging her to make new memories with Shiki and Aya. The next day, the bickering between Aya and Khan continues. Akira begs Kabane to put an end to the madness by declaring who he loves the most, and without hesitation, Kabane chooses Inugami. Honestly surprised he didn't choose Shiki. As our story draws near to its conclusion, we are finally introduced to Akira's long lost twin, who has just arrived in Tokyo to locate his brother. After blatantly walking through another man, they pulled him into an alley to harass him. Realizing that the drunk fools won't help him find Akira, the brother decides to turn them into snow golems. He makes a display of ice power that's completely unlike Akira. Meanwhile, Akira whines about his stuffed toy, Nissan, suddenly becoming ripped open. Fortunately for him, our cranky vampire Mihai just happens to be into sewing and completely restores the stuffed animal. Mihai was so bored in fact, that he wound up installing an AI into it as well, making it capable of speech. Akira, thrilled with his new and approved Nissan, wonders where his real brother could be. We cut to Akira's twin brother, and a bit more about their past is revealed. When Akira was younger, his brother had always looked out for him, but they were forbidden from leaving the village. After all, they were the only men. Their every care was tended to, but there was a looming dread that once they were old enough, they'd be subjected to Snoo Snoo until another man was born. In the present, Akira's clumsiness just goes into full overdrive. Throughout the day, Akira starts to become an even bigger failure than Khan, making a mess at every turn, and making an even bigger mess when he attempts to clean it up. Shiki fusses at him and tells him that he'd rather Akira just go AFK than bother to help. And in Kabane's words, he never expected much out of Akira anyway. Akira doesn't take it well and decides to run away. By turn of fate, he actually runs into his older brother, who we learn is named Yui. We get a flashback of the twin brothers discussing how they'll escape to Tokyo and find a man named Inugami. In the present, it's clear that Yui still cares deeply about his brother, but he seems to be more stern than Akira remembers. He even rejects a crepe that Akira offers him, saying Akira should have the entire thing. Back at the office, Kabane and Shiki learn that Akira ran away, but they choose to do absolutely nothing about it. While lounging around, Kabane quickly realizes that his dynamic with Shiki has been completely thrown off by Akira's absence. Yui takes Akira to the forest so that they can remain out of sight. He must create the perfect hideout so that they can go completely unnoticed in the middle of a park in Japan. A gargantuan ice castle. Perfect. No one will find us here. Anyway. Akira quickly learns that his brothers changed since they were separated when Yui breaks his phone, claiming he won't need it anymore. He then proceeds to lock Akira in the mansion while he prepares the furniture that Akira requested. Back at the office, Kabane proposes to Shiki that they bring Akira back. Shiki also understands that without Akira, their group is missing something very important, so he agrees. It isn't long before the world discovers the bulging ice castle in the middle of Japan during spring, and now it's been posted all over social media. There's no doubt that it's the work of a kimono and the gang rushed to get to the bottom of it. Outside the castle, news stations have rounded up to report on it. From inside, Yui emerges, and bro makes it very clear that he ain't here to talk. Just throw hands. But remember, Inugami keeps his blicky on him for times like this. He fires at Yui to stop his attack, saving all the humans. Yui reveals that he's grateful to Inugami for taking care of Akira, but he ain't letting nobody see him. Inagami knows something's up with little dude because his power shouldn't be this strong. That's when it's revealed that Yui has a null stone attached to his chest. Similar to Kabane's life stone, it has kimono power embedded into it, granting Yui his strength. You already know Kabane don't give a fuck and is ready to run the fade regardless. Unfortunately, the fade runs him this time as well as Shiki and Inugami because the next time we see them, they're wedding decorations. When Akira sees his friends in this state, he crumbles, wondering how Yui could do something so heartless. Yui thinks that Akira is just sick and claims that he'll go out to get medicine, leaving Akira locked in once again. While Akira grieves, the AI that Mihai engineered informs Akira that everyone is still alive. They can be saved if the ice is thawed out. We get another flashback about Akira and Yui's past. Yui was ordained the chief of the village and was thus subjected to the only thing the woman couldn't do by themselves. Ranting. Yui was constantly pressed by the females because of their jealousy or envy of each other. He would come home exhausted every night, but always found comfort in seeing Akira happy. Which is why, despite the no-stone turning him cold-hearted, he still cares deeply about Akira's well-being. Akira manages to send Yui outside for another gathering trip, which grants him time to help Kabane and the others. 
like a moth to flame, and Nari arrives at the castle now that she knows a Null Stone is at play. She reveals that apparently the Null Stone drains the life of everything around it in order to create its ice, which explains why Yui didn't need any water. On the inside, Kabana gets so heated about taking his first L that he manages to melt the ice away and break free. He tells Akira that he's gotta get his get back, especially because he wants Akira to return to the office. We hear Akira's inner turmoil, realizing that if Kabane fights Yui again, they'll surely die this time. So in order to protect them, Akira flips a switch and tells Kabane he actually hates all of them. In the mist, it's probably the first time Akira has actually sounded like his gender. After throwing Kabane for a loop, Yui returns, ready to turn Kabane into preserves for next year. But Akira jumps in and tells Yui that they should just leave and find a new home, to which Yui agrees. The two walk off into the forest, but not before Akira bids him farewell. Kabane begins the process to help Inugami and Shiki thaw quicker when Inari emerges from nowhere. Hey, way to join it once the threat is gone. Inari assures him that she's only after the Null Stone this time, and Kabane should be interested too, since it's connected to his parents. In another flashback, it's revealed how Akira and Yui became separated in the first place. Yui had been fighting for dear life every night, enduring the constant rambling of the woman in the village. While on a stroll with Yui, Yui confesses to peeing the bed despite being 14 years old. Akira finds it funny at first, until he realizes that it's more plausible that little homie was transitioning into manhood. He knew if any other woman found out, they'd compete for Akira like the final chicken wing at the cookout. Yui devises a plan to allow Akira's departure, and in return, he'd satisfy the woman until their heart's content. The woman agreed to his demands and Yui sees Akira off. Later that night, Yui discovers that the woman never intended to honor their agreement, and has sent someone to kill Akira. Bound by ropes and enraged, Yui heads towards the mountain where the Null Stone is kept. In the present, Yui and Akira are ambushed by Nobimaru. Nobimaru quickly learns that Yui don't play that shit and almost gets no diffed. Nobimaru decides it's time to go all out before he really dies and attacks with everything he has, but it's all swatted away by Yui. Nobimaru only manages to get close once Yui is distracted by Akira. He immediately goes for the Null Stone and it nullifies all of his moisturizer. Damn near crippled, Nobimaru retreats. He curses Anari, realizing why she has sent him instead of herself. While trying to form a plan, Yui makes another attack and Nobimaru isn't able to dodge it. Luckily, Kabane arrives just in time to save Nobimaru. The two of them team up, and in order to defeat Yui, Nobimaru asks Kabane if he's ever seen Ghost Rider. By utilizing his regeneration, they set Kabane on fire, allowing him to directly counter the ice while attacking. Once Yui realizes it, he says, Fuck it, ice times two! And now it counters the flames. So Kabane and Nobimaru say, Fuck it, fire times two! And now it counters the ice again. Unfortunately, Kabane forgot to say, Fuck it, healing times two, because his body starts breaking down from the flames before he can finish off Yui. Yui tries to use the power again, but it's revealed that he doesn't exactly have the facilities for that. The No Stone says, fuck it, life drain times two, and Yui's body begins to decay. Nobimaru makes it clear that if they leave him like that, his body will wither away in a matter of moments. But of course, neither Akira nor Kabane stand by and wait for it to happen. Akira tries to pull out the No Stone and is flooded with Yui's memories, revealing how he destroyed the snowy village and became attached to the stone. Kabane reaches in to help, and like it has a mind of its own, his life stone ejects from his mouth and attaches to the No Stone. Yui is freed and Inari acquires the stone, but after Inugami argues with her over who the stone belongs to, she relinquishes it to the kids and takes her leave. Later, Yui is treated by Aya who makes up a random billing cost that Shiki calls out as too high. Akira makes amends with Kabane, apologizing for what he did at the ice castle. He doesn't hate them, in fact, he loves them. The two celebrate their mutual feelings of companionship until Yui awakens. A little more lore on the world with kimonos is unveiled. Thousands of years ago, a war between kimonos and humans was waged, known as the Kimono Incidents. The war was only ended by the kimonos reshaping everyone's memories in order to live alongside humans. Apparently, the stones were created to prevent the kimono incidents from being repeated and were passed down by the most powerful kimono of the time, implying that Kabane's heritage may have been of the most powerful kimono. There are also other stones spread out through Japan, and only Japan because apparently Japan is the only country that exists in anime. Anyway. Yui allows Kabane to keep the stone as thanks for what he did. He wishes to atone for his sins and is ready to take the blame all on his own. That's when Akira argues with him, claiming that he should stop being selfish about his pain since that's what led them here in the first place. 
Yuen insists that only he should be blamed, but Akira finally gets through to him when he begins crying about how he can't be happy if his brother just keeps pushing him to the sidelines. In the end, Yui is forgiven by everyone and they commemorate it with a picture. Nobimaru recruits Kong to spy on Kabane for Inari. Well, less spying and more manipulating him into giving up his lifestyle. Kabane and Ugami must travel around Japan to find more stones, in hopes of discovering who his parents are. Our season ends with Shiki deciding to stay with his family, Akira going full fimboy and journeying with his brother, and our main protagonist, accompanied by Inugami and Khan, setting off to find the stones. <sighs> Alright, let's make a bet on whether Kabane's parents are dead or alive. If you made it this far, leave your guess in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you in the next one.